Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about poor decision making. I'll give you a real life example. The other day I went to cash in some lottery scratch off tickets. It wasn't much, just $29 in total. Instead of just taking that money and leaving, I decided to buy some more scratch offs and try and double my winnings. So I'm very happy to report that I turned my $29 into a cool $0. A very fantastic decision by me. Of course, that was a relatively low stakes decision. I mean, money is money, but still. So let's talk about a much higher stakes series of decisions pre World War II and into World War II that Germany made. Now, there are definitely a few decisions that Germany can be critiqued on in how they went about World War II, strictly from a military tactical perspective. If we start going into the moral realm, we'll be here for the next year and a half. We can look at Dunkirk and the halting of German forces that allowed Allied troops the opportunity to flesh out an escape plan. We can look at the Eastern Front with the German invasion of the Soviet Union and critique and debate German attack planning and logistical failures, with either the failure to fully focus on the oil-rich fields to the south or the failure to fully focus on taking Moscow and dealing a major blow to the Soviet government. We can also look at the Battle of the Bulge and Hitler's naive belief that he would be able to push Allied forces to Belgian shores and force them to sue for peace. The thing that I want to critique here, though, is German naval planning. As the recently new-to-power German government was marching ever closer to starting a new world war, Germany would undergo a plan of rapid industrialization and militarization, despite technically still being bound by the Treaty of Versailles. Military branches would be built up substantially, new modern tanks, planes, and guns would all be built, and plans would be laid to invade their neighbors. One area that severely lacked consistent focus, though, was the German Navy, or Kriegsmarine. Looking at what the German military planned on doing initially, it isn't terribly surprising that their naval investment was lacking a bit behind. They planned on starting a land-based war, in the immediate sense, against Poland and France, basically just in mainland Europe. They then later planned on fighting the British, but ideally, the relatively short water distance from France to the UK wouldn't be that much of an issue. Still, Germany did plan to completely revamp their navy with a swath of new modern ships. From four new aircraft carriers to nearly a dozen battleships to dozens of cruisers and torpedo boats. These plans were formulated from around 1936 to early 1939, and not terribly long after the war started, a good deal of the planned naval construction would be cancelled, with resources being diverted to more pressing and immediate military needs. No carriers would be completed at this time. Just a handful of cruisers were completed, and four battleships were completed. For the bulk of the war, Germany's primary focus would end up being U-boats, with over 1,000 being made and sinking nearly 3,000 Allied merchant vessels. From a sort of war of attrition perspective, the U-boats were good for restricting resources and choking out their enemies, but for larger-scale naval combat, they weren't that much of a thing. The types of ships that would end up reigning supreme in World War II would be the aircraft carriers, with Japan, Britain, and America proving that in epic battles over in the Pacific. From a tactical perspective, carriers are incredibly valuable, giving a country an ability to have this mobile base from which to launch attacks. This was especially helpful as aircraft ranges are rather limited, and mid-air refueling while technically a thing at this point, was incredibly uncommon. This would make it far easier to, say, launch bombing raids against distant targets. So when Germany laid plans to construct aircraft carriers, they also laid plans to construct carrier-based aircraft to go along with them. 
This ended up creating a bizarre little conundrum when German plans shifted, leaving them with carrier-based aircraft, but no carrier from which to use them. This is the lone uniquely designed carrier-based aircraft that Germany had. This is the Feisler Fi-167 torpedo bomber. In mid-1935, an agreement between Germany and Britain allowed Germany to effectively violate aspects of the Treaty of Versailles and increase their naval ship tonnage without significant consequence. They would still be limited, though, to just 35% of what Britain had, ideally keeping them at an automatic disadvantage. The signing of this agreement led to the planned construction of the so-called Graf Zeppelin class of carriers. Initially, four were to be made, but this was later reduced to just two. These carriers would roughly be on par with America's Yorktown carriers, with the Graf carriers measuring in at 262.5 meters long. As Germany was relatively inexperienced when it came to carrier construction and design, significantly more focus was placed on the ship's armament, rather than the planes that would be going on it. To be sure, the planes were still the primary focus, but Germany made their carriers much more heavily armed defensively than their American and Japanese counterparts. For example, on American Yorktown carriers, standard armament was a total of 36 guns, two-thirds of which were 50 caliber machine guns. On the Graf carriers, they were planned to have 78 total guns, ranging from 20mm flak guns to 150mm naval cannons. In essence, German carriers would have been like combination battleship carriers, these floating fortresses. Housed on these carriers would be an outfit of around 42 aircraft, consisting of three different designs, two of which were modified versions of planes already in production, and one would be a unique design. To serve as a fighter, a variant of the BF-109 called the BF-109T, which strangely enough would not have folding wings like was more common on carriers, would begin testing and design. For dive bombers, the Ju-87 Stuka would be selected, and the Ju-87C would begin testing and initial production as well. This plane would actually have folding wings. Odd for this one to have folding wings, but the fighter to not. Then, for a torpedo bomber, Germany would issue a design request for the construction of an all-metal biplane with excellent handling and relatively high speeds. To this request, the companies Feisler and Arado would respond, with the FI-167 and the AR-195, respectively. The losing design, the AR-195, honestly looked like a plane that was made a decade ago, outfitted with a BMW 132 radial air-cooled engine with just 830 horsepower, the 195 failed to reach the expectations of the German military. They wanted a plane that could hit at least 186 miles an hour and had a range of 631 miles and the 195 couldn't do that. It had a top speed of just 180 miles an hour and a range of just 400 miles. So unless the 167 was somehow even worse, the 195 was basically doomed. The 167 came in and not only improved upon the 195, but went above the requirements to a somewhat impressive degree. Measuring in at 11.4 meters long, 13.5 meters wide, and 4.8 meters tall, outfitted with a Daimler-Benz DB601 inline liquid-cooled engine with 1,100 horsepower to its name, the 167 would manage a top speed of 202 miles an hour, which doesn't necessarily sound impressive, but for being an all-metal biplane and how large it was, weighing almost 10,000 pounds gross, 200 miles an hour was actually kind of impressive. Additionally, it would have a base range of 810 miles and a maximum range of 930 if it was outfitted with a drop tank. Armament-wise, it would improve upon the 195, 
by not only having a larger torpedo it could carry, but also having a larger potential bomb load if it was configured for more standard level bombing. The 195 would be fitted with a 1500 pound torpedo, while the 167 would have a 1600 pound torpedo. In bomber configuration, the 195 had a max load of just 1100 pounds in various configurations, while the 167 would double that at 2200 pounds. The only sort of push here would be its guns, with both of these planes having a single MG-17 firing forward and an MG-15 firing to the rear. All things considered, these were basically token guns that wouldn't be doing all that much other than just being there. In the 167's initial flight testing, taking place sometime between late 1937 and mid-1938, it displayed remarkable low-speed flight control and maneuverability. This is likely why Germany wanted a biplane design for the extra lift that the wing would generate, and thus the better low-speed control it would ideally have. Combine the extra wing with leading edge slats that aided in control, the 167 was nearly capable of being called a VTOL aircraft, being able to take off and land in incredibly short distances or in a particularly strong headwind, likely a completely vertical takeoff and landing. As far as torpedo bombers from the late 30s are concerned, the 167 performed quite well. It didn't have the speed that the Japanese Kate had, nor the total power that the British Beaufort had, but its relatively solid speed for the class, and for a biplane for that matter, along with fantastic low speed control, probably put it in the upper echelon of torpedo bomber designs. Additionally, the 167 had what I think was a pretty interesting little design feature. Since they would be operating over water, they had two interconnected features in the event that the plane went down into the water. For one, they had some inflatable dinghies for the pilot and gunner, probably standard on a lot of carrier-based planes. For two, it had a feature that the pilot could just flip a switch and the landing gear would just be blown off. This, in some sense, would help the plane float better, giving the crew more time to inflate their dinghies and escape. A small but pretty neat design addition. However, no matter how well the 167 tested, actual progress and production of the design was forced to be sluggish, in line with the sluggish construction of the Graf Zeppelin carriers, as 800-foot boats take a lot longer to build than 40-foot planes, because it wasn't believed that the carriers would be done by at least late 1940, early 1941 in the best case scenario, the 167 was incredibly low priority. Instead, Feisler would focus more on the FI-156 Storch, also well known for its low speed performance and its role as a recon and communications plane. While construction on the carriers continued, Feisler did build a small pre-production run of 12 FI-167s to go along with a couple prototypes. And because the 167 was so intertwined with the carriers, when construction of the carriers was canceled around April 1940, despite one of them being at least 85% complete, the production of the 167 would also be halted, stopping with just the initial 14 total made. After all, if Germany wasn't going to be making aircraft carriers, then why exactly would they need a specially made carrier-based torpedo bomber? This left the 167 without a place to call home. But since they had built them anyway, Germany elected to use them for something at the very least, and at least the 12 pre-production models would be shipped over to German-controlled Holland in the Netherlands to undergo flight testing and some kind of evaluation. What exactly that evaluation was, I do not know. I couldn't find anything that specified exactly what they were doing. If I had to speculate, I imagine they were testing how it could perform in its natural role as a torpedo bomber, or how it could perform in other potential roles, 
perhaps as recon, or maybe as an, I don't know, emergency interceptor. Regardless of what exactly they were doing over there, this is where these planes would be from 1940 up until 1943, before they were returned to Germany proper. In that time, though, there was a ray of hope for the 167 after early 1942 signaled something promising. Apparently learning from their allies, the Imperial Japanese, Germany and Hitler realized that carriers can be quite the powerful weapon. So in May 1942, construction of the main flagship Graf Zeppelin carrier was ordered to resume. At least in theory, this meant that the production of the 167 would be able to resume as well, as the carrier would still need planes, and just 14 total aircraft wouldn't really be enough. They still needed at least the main outfit and some reserves. Unfortunately for Feisler, though, who were no doubt sitting by the phone and waiting for it to ring, that call would never come. Instead of ramping up production of a plane otherwise not already in production to begin with, it was decided that the Ju-87 Stuka would be serving as the torpedo bomber as well as the dive bomber. Versatility is a major selling point on carriers, where space is inherently limited. The more roles one single plane can do, the better. Plus, with how the Stuka was designed with the inverted gull wings, it would ideally easily fit a torpedo. Plus, even though the Stuka was kinda slow, with a speed upwards of 255 miles an hour, it was still a good deal faster than the 167. It certainly wouldn't have the low speed control or virtual VTOL capabilities, but the benefit of having to use only one plane for two rolls would certainly outweigh that benefit. This once again left the 167s without a place to call home. Well, I guess they technically had a home, but they weren't allowed inside. It's like the Ju-87 filed a restraining order. So when the 167s over in Holland were returned to Germany proper, the Luftwaffe didn't really have anything for them to do. So they decided just to sell them off to an ally of theirs in the independent in name only state of Croatia. In reality, Croatia was a puppet government at the time. Croatia would receive 10 or 11 167s sometime in mid to late 1944, and they would be used sparingly for bombing enemy positions. Exactly what damage they cause, I do not know either. And they were mainly used for just transporting goods. By the end of the war, just four of them remained due to general attrition, and these four would then shift over to some post-war use by the newly founded Yugoslavian army, who would have them for a few years, before in all likelihood they were scrapped. As for the Graf Zeppelin carrier that was nearing completion again, its fate would be sealed by things outside of its control, as a failed attack and heated argument led to its cancellation once again. In late December 1942, New Year's Eve, the German Navy, armed with two heavy cruisers and six destroyers, set out to destroy some merchant vessels that were sailing from Scotland to the Soviet port city of Murmansk in northwest Russia, not terribly far from the border with Finland. They would be traveling near the coast of Norway and into the Barents Sea. And because Germany at this point controlled Norway after invading in April 1940, this gave them the prime opportunity to cut off some Allied aid to the Soviets. So when the merchant convoy that was escorted by two light cruisers, six destroyers, two corvettes, one minesweeper, and two trawlers was spotted by some German aircraft, the German naval unit was sent in to destroy the convoy. In this battle, known as the Battle of the Barents Sea, a combination of poor visibility, tactical prowess, and just mistakes made the losses experienced by both sides an effective push, but a loss nonetheless for Germany. Because of a combination of low light due to the Arctic winter basically making sunlight last just a few hours at most, and snowy conditions, 
ships on both sides found it rather difficult to spot and identify one another, leading to situations where enemy ships would mistake each other for allied ships and just sail next to each other. This kind of mistake is how one German destroyer was lost. Additionally, some tactical prowess from the British, in one major instance faking a torpedo attack that caused German vessels to flee, helped keep British vessels afloat and German vessels at bay. After all was said and done, the Germans did manage to take out more British ships, with Germany losing one destroyer and suffering damage to one cruiser, while Britain would lose one destroyer of their own, a minesweeper and another destroyer was damaged. Most importantly though, all of the merchant vessels would escape unharmed. Despite sinking more ships, Germany would lose the battle, and the resources were delivered to the Soviets as scheduled. This failure for the Germans sent Hitler into an absolute tizzy. In his mind, what would be the point of building up a new naval fleet of surface vessels, in destroyers, carriers, battleships, etc., if they were so incompetent that they couldn't take out merchant ships. Plus, with the success that the U-boats had been having over in the Atlantic against merchant vessels, this made it clear to Hitler that the focus of the Navy needed to be around U-boats. In a tirade to Admiral Erich Rader, then the commander of the Kriegsmarine, Hitler ordered that the surface fleet be scrapped, and that production of U-boats be prioritized. Raider would resign in response, and his successor, Karl Donitz, managed to keep what remained of the surface fleet from being scrapped, but new major ships would not be commissioned from that point on, and all focus would be in U-boats. This, of course, meant that the Graf Zeppelin, then in the process of being upgraded and revamped, would have its construction halted yet again. From here until April 1945, the incomplete carrier sat in harbor doing nothing, before finally being scuttled in Poland. The ship was then raised by the Soviets and used as target practice, being sunk again in 1947. With this being the end of the German aircraft carrier dream, I do think it very much raises the question, of how different World War II could have been if Germany had carriers or just a stronger navy in general. Really, this topic could be an entire video all on its own, going through every naval and coastal battle to try and figure out how things could have been different. To just look at one major battle real quick, let's look at the Battle of Britain. Because Germany was largely operating from the French coastline, this would limit their potential targets and overall avenue of attack, because they lack sufficient long-range aircraft as well that could protect bombers, this led to heavy losses. Britain could effectively concentrate their forces to the south and take out either the lacking heavy escort fighters or eventually unescorted bombers. Ideally, if Germany had a stronger navy or a few carriers, this would surely help in softening up the British defenses and force them to spread their defenders around to other areas. Perhaps with a carrier or two, Germany could potentially launch strong attacks around Scotland or over in Ireland, giving them some kind of foothold or at least some kind of diversion that would have softened London's defenses. There are truly a lot of routes that you could take this, playing war games with a hypothetically stronger German navy. So you tell me, what could a stronger German navy have meant for the Battle of Britain and World War II in general? Do you think it would have changed anything? I mean, you can't really be wrong, because it's basically alt-history, and all you need are kind of just some vibes. But as for the Feisler Fi-167, it still holds the odd distinction of being the only uniquely designed carrier-based plane that Germany had, made stranger by the fact that Germany had no carriers. Its failure to really do anything at all was because of issues outside of its control. For a torpedo bomber, it was a pretty solid plane, not the fastest, but maneuverable and able to carry a solid bomb load. 
Ultimately, though, it probably would have went the way most other torpedo bombers went in the way of the Dodo. Specifically designed torpedo bombers became outdated as the war went on, and more versatile planes were used in their place. From the death of the torpedo bomber came the rise of multi-role aircraft, and inevitably the 167 would have been pulled from active duty and replaced with something else. In essence, the 167, no matter what happened, was kind of screwed. Alright, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. To go back to the beginning, what I don't understand about scratch-offs, and specifically the way people play them, are the people that just stand at the machine, scratch off the prize check QR code, and scan it right there. I mean, at least play the game that's on the card. It'd be like if you went up to a slot machine, pulled on the lever, and then the machine just said win or lose on the screen, and literally nothing else. I mean, at least act like you aren't just throwing your money away. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!